Okay, first of all, we're going to go to Romans chapter 7, please. We're going to look at Romans chapter 7. So, addiction, it goes through three dangerous steps. So clinical psychologists and scientists, they found that there were three different steps that goes with addiction, which is kind of dangerous. We're going to be covering those three steps. Okay, so we're going to be covering three steps concerning addictions, which is pretty dangerous. And a lot of people have not considered about these factors. The first thing, which is pretty interesting uh, concerning addiction, is that there is pleasure. Now I want you to also turn to Hebrews chapter 11, please. Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to also turn to Hebrews chapter 11. When you first take the drug or the substance or anything that gives pleasure to you in life, what you've got to understand is that it does give you pleasure. It does make you feel good. That's what you got to understand about sin. It makes you feel good. It's like the best thing you ever experienced before once you tasted it. Hebrews chapter 11. Notice what the Word of God says concerning sin. And he brings Moses as an example at verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So it's very important to understand that in Hebrews 11.25, the pleasure is high. So in a person's mind right here, so in this person, so I'm going to draw like an invisible brain here. So just one of those drawings again by Pastor Kim, all right? So in this person's mind, you understand that there's a point right here known as a pleasure point. And then what's going on is that when you hit the drug or the substance level, it hits it. It hits it really high. It never hit that high before. So because it's hitting high, you got to understand this too, it's at that moment. That's why the Bible says there's pleasure in sin. How long? For a season. For a season. And that's what people don't understand is that the negative effect toward this, so the positive may seem like it's pleasure, but there's a negative side to this, and that it's temporary. Because of that, everybody has a pleasure system in their mind, you gotta understand. Everyone has a pleasure system in their mind. But the drug is a thing that's the only thing that raises it that high. It's the only thing that raises it that high and that satisfying. So because of that, it's at that moment, you're going to depend on. That's the first step. You never felt anything like that. That moment. So you want to get that moment back. Then we come to a second step right here. What happens is, is that then there's an imbalance. What happens throughout this imbalance? What happens is, is that everyone has a pleasure point, but they also have a stressor area. The brain is balanced in that sense. God made you balanced. He produced within us positive and negative uh, aspects within our personal personality, uh, within our body. The brain, you must understand, cannot feel and sense that pleasure moment all the stinking time. It cannot do that. So everyday activities that we go through, such as eating a good food that we eat, or riding a thrill from a roller coaster, and then stuff that we do in our own time, like doing artwork, stuff that brings us pleasure and joy, those things are our pleasure things. But the problem with the drug is that it hit this high. So the, pre the pleasure level, which was originally right here for every day, for daily activities, now has been raised to a higher level. Let's say about here. This is what drugs did. And this is what is normal. Now think about it. That, then you can't enjoy everyday life. That's why when you're like eating a meal, spending time with the opposite sex, 
or enjoying a movie or playing with toys or playing a game, riding a thrill, it does not give you that much pleasure because you sense a new kind of pleasure that was higher. Now, because of that, there's an imbalance because your pleasure point hit this high. And because it hit this high, there has to be a stressor kicking in. When this stressor kicks in, because your pleasure point and stressor have been imbalanced, the pleasure raised this high only on the drug because it's momentary, temporary. So let's say that you don't feel that momentary experience anymore. What happens after that then? What happens to the stressor? That raises high. Now think about this. This is why this is consequential concerning <coughs> sin. Concerning sin, what it does is that it affects your whole life. Everyday living in life. Now, without this drug, you're going to feel stressed out, tension, negative side effects without this drug. That's why you want to go back to the drug again. You're feeling that itch. You're feeling that I want that drive again because that stressor now is kicking in more. There's that imbalance. Whereas before you took the drug, it was the stressor and the pleasure balanced itself out. But now you've hit the pleasure point so high that once you're not on it, then the stressor is going to kick really high. That's why they get more fleshy, more depressed, more susceptible. So there's an imbalance. That's what sin does. Sin it not only gives pleasure for a season, but what it does is that it brings damage and ruin to your life. So go to James now. Keep your hand at Romans 7, but go to James now. You can get off at Hebrews. Go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And then we'll read verse 14. James chapter 1. We'll read verse 14. Now what does it do? It brings a deadly life. There's an imbalance and now it's just leading you toward more and more toward death. It's interesting how many drug addicts, which is sad, a lot of them would uh, commit suicide or a lot of them have been overdosed with drugs. It's actually become bad in hospital cases. Uh, I could be wrong, but from what I heard, a greater majority of them uh, died because due to drug effects, which is kind of interesting. But anyways, let's go to James chapter 1 here. And verse 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. The, and sin, when it is what? Finished. Finished, see, bringeth forth death. See, so you're enjoying that sin, that pleasure. But once that thing is finished, now the death kicks in. Now those deadly emotions, those things that will lead you to death, starts kicking in. That's why it's pretty sad. Some of them who live this addict life, they feel like that most of their life is just death. Now let's look at Romans chapter 7. Romans 7. You know what the most dangerous thing is? Here's the most dangerous thing. And I don't know if you thought about this before concerning sin. It affects your logic thinking. You might say, how so? Well, what happens at this step is that it did not reach your logical or your thinking functions yet. It's hitting the pleasure point. But once you keep hitting that pleasure point, and those dopamines, which is your uh, pleasure sensors part of the brain, starts kicking in more and more and more. It's affecting more and more of your brain. And pretty soon now it's going to affect the thinking, the logic and the thinking area. Now, you know what happens after that? When it affects, this is the most dangerous thing. When it affects the logic and the thinking area, you know what you do now? What you do now is now you think about doing the drug. Now you think about, I have to have a drink. I got to get a smoke. Now it affects your logic. Before it was your sensations, but now it's affecting your thinking. And that's why some people, when they have a drug addict mind, they feel like I got to uh, do the drug again. That's why you'll see some of them making excuses, right? Making excuses to go back into the drugs. You know why? It affected their thinking now. 
Their rationality has been gone. And they're spending their rationality on drugs. On drugs. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 7. You know what it does now? It's deception. It deceives you. It deceives you. The Bible says in verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which, is, which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but who? Sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will to, is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, what? I find not. Uh, verse 20, now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but what? Sin that dwelleth in me. Now look at this. Verse 22, 23, 24, it's affecting Paul. So sin can come to a point where it affects your logic and thinking. Because Paul knows he has one part of him. That's the nature, uh, that's the spiritual nature that wants to do what is right, wants to do what is clean. But now there's a side to him, a dark side to him that says, no, I want to sin. I lust after sin. Paul, he said that in verse 17, that's the right thing to say. It's not that I that do it, but what? Sin that dwelleth in me. In 15 through 24, you lose the battle if you lose that spiritual nature of yours where it doesn't think that I want to do what's right. I want to get off of drugs. I want to get off of sin. It's not just drug addiction, folks. This is like any kind of addiction that you go through. And then that pleasure point hits at a high. And when it hits at a high, that's why it makes sense why you feel miserable, tired, drained, depressed, and discouraged throughout the days. Because there you hit that pleasure point too much. And that's Satan's greatest deception is to truly make sin pleasurable, but for how long? God told you over and over again for a season. Yeah. But it, it ruins your entire life. You can't enjoy life. You can't enjoy life because the pleasure point hit this high. But God put it at a balanced level for a reason. And now it deceives you. What did the Bible say in Jeremiah about the heart? The heart is wicked, deceitful, who can know it, who can know it. God was way ahead and he already gave you the solutions on what to do. If people read the word of God and abided by it, rather than spending thousands of dollars on therapy and psychobabble, then they could have gotten the main sense. Psychologists and scientists caught up hundreds if not thousands of years later. The Bible was behind you all that was way ahead, was way ahead before anyone caught up with it. So, I hope that you understand the detrimental effects of sin, that this is a sobering thought, and that's something that you should consider in your life. By the way, this addiction, definitely, I have to preach this. I have to preach this because we live in this day and age. On, this definitely includes the, this demonic device Amen. that you got in your hands. Mm -hmm. Because there is an addiction, clinical psychologists and scientists study this matter, there is an addiction where you hit your pleasure point right there. Yeah. That's why people cannot survive without it. Yeah. If you get to a point where you have to sleep next to it, you do know it affected their thinking. <laughs> do I hear conviction in this room? Amen. Yeah. Who would naturally put it next to them when they sleep? Unless they think they need it that badly. Unless they think it, they need it that badly. Nowadays, preachers, what they're doing is that they're not preaching from the Bible. They're preaching from iPad. That's what they're doing. They're preaching from iPad. Find the verse that they can select. It's not from the Word of God itself. Now, we can use technology, but see, that Satan's deception is that where you depend on it so much, rather than on God, that you now become into this phase that there's no turning back. If you don't know if you're an addict or not, here's good advice. Go out in the camp of God's creation and do without technology for one week. And if you're shaking and stuff like that, you know you got a problem. You know you got a problem. You, you must be an addict then in that sense.